We're going to talk about Revelation chapter 7 today. Revelation chapter 7. If you can understand a little of the background, six seals ha have been, been opened. And uh, uh, they, they point to the day of the Lord. They point to the wrath of God. And there has been a revelation of those things on earth and, and this, also the scene that is in heaven as martyred souls cry out uh, to God on their behalf. And now chapter 7, there is a calm in the midst of the storm. Uh, more storms to come. Uh, the seventh seal is going to open up seven trumpets and seven trumpets will open up seven vials that are going to be poured out on, on the earth that, that we will be looking at. Uh, but though that there's not storms now, uh, the furies kind of have, have resided as, as we see an overall picture of the revelation. Uh, but, but now that the fury has subsided, God has plans yet for the future of those things that are going to happen during those seven years of tribulation, the first half is relatively calm, and then everything turns loose. Uh, so we find that in the providence of God, there is more for God to do during this period of the revelation. Now, providence just means the wisdom and the guidance and the provisions of God uh, for the revelation that is about to be uh, unfolded or revealed to us. Uh, God is in control uh, of time and, and, and space and, and matter. Uh, he is over uh, nature. He is over his people Israel. It is he is the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof and they that dwell therein. He's the boss. He's the chief. He knows what's going on and nothing has happened uh, that is not in his, his controlling interest that, that he has. The first thing that, that we notice is, is God's uh, providential care for, for his own. And, and we, we uh, notice that there is a scripture in those first three verses where it says, after these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending uh, from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their forehead. At the forefront uh, of, of the events that are transpiring and, and taking place, there, there are angels. Uh, if we were to do a study uh, uh, of angels, uh, which is needful and necessary. We would probably want to find Billy Graham's book that, that he wrote during the 80s. Angelology is a, is a particularly interesting study, uh, but not for this particular time that, that we have here. These angels are numbered. There's four of them that are standing at the four corners of the earth. Uh, now we've got a flat earth theology, but not really. Uh, what John is trying to tell us that, that these angels uh, are, are all around us and, and they are those creatures that do the bidding uh, of God. We see them and, as messengers of God and servants of God. Angels belong to God. And even though that we have a guardian angel... Uh, it is not subject to our orders or to our wishes. We find out that sometimes people tend to think that, that, that they're my guardian angel so I can give them uh, instructions as how they uh, are going to act. That was a popular movement. Boy, you know, station God's angels here, station God's angels over there. God does all that stuff. 
Uh, he, don't, he don't let us have anything. They're, they're his messengers. They're his created beings. And of course, the fallen ones, they are satan, uh, satanic and, and, and they are demonic uh, spirits that are called unclean spirits. But we, we have angels. And John saw that there were four of them standing, uh, uh, holding the, the four winds of, of the earth. You understand that in this particular setting that, that angels are in charge of the wind. They said that there are four directions, north, east, south, and west, uh, from which the wind blows. And, and they are holding these four winds together. I'm not a meteorologist. I'm a lot of things. I'm not one of those things. Uh, that uh, wind, uh, in this particular case, is going to be the fact that the wind is not going to blow. Not that the wind blows. Uh, we're terrified of tornadoes. I've been in a couple of those. Uh, they're necessary and, and needful. Hurricanes, uh, I've ridden a couple of those out. Linda and I have while we were down on the Gulf Coast in, in, in October. They were just baby ones. They were one category. But the wind did blow and, and, and the rains did fall. We find out that these four angels are in control of the wind so that it does not blow on the earth, the sea, or any tree. Now, for those fishermen that are here, they know the favorite saying that wind is your friend. If you go to, to, to fish on one of those very placid days, uh, generally, uh, you're, you're going to come home uh, and, and you're not going to have anything that you can brag about. Wind, as it blows, churns up the water and it makes the fish happy and, and they, they like, like to, to bite. Wind, we always assume, is a natural occurrence that, that takes place. We just call it nature sometimes when, when we see all of these things that are out there. We find out that, that there are winds that blow. They used to be called a jet stream that, that would go up in the atmosphere and, and it changed how things were, were going to be as far as weather patterns according to how low it dipped and, and how fast it was blowing. It's now called an atmospheric river. So when you hear the meteorologist talking about an atmospheric river, it is just merely the fact that it is the jet stream that, that we used to know. But God is in control of, of all of this. The responsibility of these angels is to keep the wind from blowing. So we have to ask ourselves the questions, what would happen if the wind quit blowing? Uh, when, when you think about the fact that, you know, all the things are calm and all the things are calm every day. Uh, in a recent article I read, it, it put forth uh, the question, what would happen to the earth if the wind quit blowing? You find out, first of all, it has to do with temperature, the hot places and cold places. The hot places will get hotter. The cold places will get colder because wind is what mixes the temperature of the atmosphere. You find out that that wind transports the hot air from from the tropics, uh, cooling it and it heats up the temperature of the colder places. The North Pole would be so cold it would be unbearable. Uh, if it were not for the winds that, that have a southerly flow and, and they flow and, and they, they control temperatures and helps it uh, to keep the climate uh, kind of the way that, that we like it. Uh, not only does it is responsible for the heat and, and the cold, we find out it is there a, a syndrome of, of being wet and, and dry. Uh, wet areas will get wetter, dry areas will get drier. And the reason for that is, is because wind moves the moisture around. What happens is, is that, that the clouds carry the moisture and the clouds form bodies uh, of, of, of water 
and from those great bodies of water, they suck up water mainly in the, from the ocean or maybe great lakes uh, like Superior and Huron and Ontario and, and, and those lakes. And, and, it, and it lets the moisture rise and, and it forms clouds. But if there were no wind, when it formed all of these clouds that it made, then it just rained right where all the clouds were. But if we get the wind to blow, then it can take the clouds and it can move it over into places that are dry. And, and sometimes we call it El Nino and sometimes we call it La Nina. Uh, it, it is the kid or, 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 or the little things. And, and, and it brings all of these clouds over here and, and it settles on, we get about 65 inches of rainfall every year. Israel gets about 15 inches of rain every year. And, and you can see how that, that in Israel, they have two rainy seasons because that's when the clouds move toward Israel and, and they drop their rain on that during two particular times of the year. So we find out that, that the hot would get hotter and the cold would get colder, the wet would get wetter and, and the dry uh, would, would stay dry. Without wind, uh, they would just form and drop the water back where they got it from. Third thing that happens is, is about oxygen and, and carbon dioxide. 25% of the oxygen that is in this world comes from, from one particular place down in the southern climate, and that is through rainforest. The winds pick up all of this oxygenated air and it brings it up here where we live and it distributes it and, and, and makes it more palatable for us. The winds not only bring the oxygen, but they carry away the carbon dioxide, the CO2 that everybody is talking about that talks about climate change. They say, oh, it's the CO2 that's doing that. Well, trees just love CO2. Uh, they say the more the merrier and trees create the oxygen and, and so by, by wind we, we get all of this mixing up so that, that we have in, in our air oxygen that we are able to breathe. Uh, the fourth thing that, that happens is, is pollination. I know everybody here just loves the spring. They just love to go out and get on their car and it's yellow. Uh, from all the pollen that there is, our, it invades our sinus cavities. Uh, it makes our car and our deck look yellow and all of these things. And we keep wondering, when will this ever go away? Well, it will go away when the wind blows. Uh, without uh, the, the, the wind blowing, uh, all, all of these particles, the pollen particles that have invaded our sinus cavities, then you could see that, that it would be difficult for plant life to survive if it wasn't for the fact that, that winds carry this pollen over there and, and it uh, fertilizes the, these trees uh, so that they can produce all, all the fruits and the nuts and the veggies that, that we eat. It is necessary for pollinization. There is a big hype now because there's not many bees left in the world. Bees do pollinate uh, plants, but we find out that when moving the pollen uh, from place to place uh, does so much better. It even takes the little seeds out of the pine cones and it blows them over there in your yard and you wonder how in the world did a pine tree start coming up in my yard? You know, and you find out that it's all because the wind is not going to blow. So we find out that these angels are sitting there under the bidding of God holding the four winds as they called north, east, south, and west so that they could not blow. But you also find in the scripture there was an angel that was designated uh, to, to not harm the earth or, or, or the sea uh, until they had gotten permission uh, to do what they were supposed to be doing as far as these people that are going to be sealed to do the work of God. So angels are numbered and angels control the wind and angels are designated uh, to harm the earth 
and, and the sea and the trees uh, when they turn the, the winds loose. So we find out that God has a providential care for the fact of the wind is not going to blow until God does something. What God does is it starts with a personal care for his own when he is going to seal the Jews, uh, which are 144,000. I would have liked to have put the scripture up there on the screen so you could see it, but it, it was too big uh, for me to do that. It would be little bitty stuff that you wouldn't be able to read. But listen to what it says in chapter 7, verses 4 to 12. It says, And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. Of the tribes of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Gad, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Asher, 12,000 were sealed. At the tribe of Naphtali, uh, 12,000. Of the tribe of Manasseh, there were 12,000. Of the tribe of Simeon, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Levi, 12,000 were sealed. The tribe of Issachar, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Zebulon, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Joseph, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000 were sealed. You have 12 different entities that are being sealed 12,000 to each one, and 12 times 12 is 144,000 special Jews that you have uh, that, that are sealed. Those being sealed are, are Jews. But when you look and see, it says that these are the tribes of Israel. Uh, but you notice if you count those and, and that you look at those, uh, you, you would wonder... Uh, what happened to Ephraim and what happened to, to Gad? Uh, we, we notice that, that they are not mentioned, that, that they are not counted. They are 12 different tribes uh, from the, the tribe of Jacob or, or of Israel. We find out that these are, are, are being sealed and those being sealed are Jewish people. Now, the question comes, and it is recorded in Romans chapter 9, has God uh, cast away Israel? And the answer came back, obviously, no, he hasn't cast away Israel. God has a special use for these people. We are during the period of, of the church age, and once the period of the church age ends, God will go back to using the Jews of the Old Testament economy. If you remember the particular calling of Abraham, who was the first Jew, and he brought him out of Ur of the Chaldees, and he had Isaac and Jacob of sons, and then they, the, the, Jacob had 12 sons, and it composed all of these tribes that, that they have. And so now God is saying to the Jewish people, hey, you were before the church and now you are after the church at the re rejection of Jesus on Calvary. Uh, God says, I will build my church and he will build a, a church, not a building, but those who are the body, the bride and the building of Christ. We are placed into the body by the by baptism and, and that we are the entity that God is using. God wanted to use Israel in a specific way. There were no evangelists in the days of the Old Testament other than Jonah, uh, and, and he was sent to, to Nineveh. God's idea of a Jewish nation was that I'm going to bless you so much that people around you are going to see the blessings of God and they're going to come running over there to you and they want to know what's a good thing going on and you're going to get to talk about Jehovah and they said, oh yeah, I want to believe in him and they're going to be circumcised and they're going to be proselytes that are brought into the Jewish economy. God says that's the way it's going to work and, and when Israel was good, that was the way it was working but Israel got to where they didn't want to do what God wanted done. They didn't 
didn't want to follow any of God's laws. And, and ultimately, when God sent his son, they killed him, put in, having put him on the cross through the Roman government and got rid of them. And God started a, a work with Gentiles, which is basically the church that we have today. So now that the church is gone, God says, I still need evangelists who will share the gospel. So he has segregated and sealed 144,000 Jews. And you notice they come from these various tribes. There are people that say that there are 10 lost tribes. I don't know who they're lost to because God knows who they are and he has put them in his program during the, the great tribulation. We understand that, that some people believe that the northern tribes don't exist anymore. After they went into Assyrian captivity, they, they didn't want to return back home. They stayed there and they intermarried with all of these other folks and, and, and they lost their identity. But they didn't lose their identity to the Lord Jesus. He knows who they are. We find out that there are these 12 groups or these 12 tribes. Manasseh is mentioned, but his brother Ephraim is not. And we find out that Joseph is now mentioned. And we find that, that Levi is excluded from the list of the priestly responsibilities. But now in this particular case, 12,000 of the tribe of Levi are going to be evangelists. So uh, we find out that Joseph is now counted where he wasn't counted before, well, along with his own son Manasseh. But Dan has been excluded. And why are Dan and, and uh, uh, Levi e excluded? Uh, it, is, it is because of the consensus of, harmon uh, uh, of the harmony of commentators that these were bad boys. And so God didn't want to use them during this period of time. Dan and Ephraim were those people or those tribes that was the most involved in the worship of Baal and those false gods. So we see that God chooses not to use Ephraim and Dan when he seals these 12,000. And why he uses 12,000 I have absolutely no idea, and I can't find anybody else that has any idea. Why is it 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes that we have? I just don't know. Uh, maybe research will help us. But what we pur purpose uh, of the 12 tribes that God has sealed, and it's going to be kept during the period of the tribulation so that the world can have a chance to respond to the goodness and the graciousness of God through the Jewish people that God is going to use. Romans chapter 11, verse number 26, it says that, so all Israel will be saved as is written, a deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn ungodliness from Jacob. In the book of Isaiah, it predicted that Israel should be saved by the Lord with an everlasting salvation, you shall not be ashamed or disgraced forever and forever. So it is during this period of time that God is going to do what was prophesied by Isaiah, what was picked up by, by the Apostle Paul when he wrote to the, German, uh, to the Roman church. So we find out that God has these seals and we remember that they are going to be the evangelists. 144,000 preachers of Jewish descent are going to go and they are going to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the Jews are going to take a prominent role that was intended for them in the Old Testament, now intended to them during the time of Jacob's trouble or Israel's trouble. And they are going to be a force that is against Satan and all of his powers and all of the works through Antichrist and the beast and false prophets and all of these folks. And, and, and God is going to say, listen, the world isn't totally given over to these kind of people. So God is going to seal them and they is going to secure them. And it is indicated that they will survive the onslaught of the Antichrist. You remember the statement of Jesus that when you see the abomination of desolations taking place in the temple, 
Then you who are on the housetops, don't bother to come down and get your clothes. Uh, you that are in the field that are working, it's time for you to get out of here. It's best that you not be a mother that has a little child that has not been weaned or someone that is pregnant because there are going to be very perilous times that are going to come upon these Jewish people. And that's the reason it's called the time of Jacob's trouble. But we find out that these 144,000 are to defy the totalitarian government of the Antichrist in his secular dominion and remind him that he has not subdued all of the masses, but there are thousands that are going to rise up and they are going to start sharing the gospel. So we find out that God sealed the Jews but we also notice that there are saints that are involved. There is another group that is going to be considered and they're going to be called Gentiles. We find out the Bible says this is what Jews are going to be doing. What is going to be happening with the Gentiles? There is going to be a great multitude of those people that are going to be saved and then their mass murders will start taking place. We find out that the camera kind of leaves earth and, and the seals Jewish people down here and it goes back into heaven once again and it is going to show us what is going to happen to all of those saints who have been martyred. They are standing before the throne and before the Lamb. This is what it says beginning in verse number 9. It says, after these things I looked and behold a great multitude which no one could number of nations, tribes, peoples, tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice saying, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels stood around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures and fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God saying, Amen, blessings and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and forever. So once again, we have another scene, but it's not on earth. On earth, 144,000 are going to be sealed to do the work of evangelists. But now we're gathered around the throne of God and, and the Lamb. And what we find there is that God is revealing his sovereignty and his sovereign actions. Even in the darkest moments of perilous times, during the devilish schemes of the beast, God is still in control and says, hey, I've got this thing the way I want it. It points to Jesus, who is the Savior of those who will trust him. Even during the period of the tribulation, there are going to be those who are saved and those who are secure. And so we need to see that, that during the period of the great tribulation, the 144,000 does a wonderful job of sharing the gospel and a number that no man can, can estimate of the multitudes of Gentiles are going to be saved and secured. But before we find out just exactly who they are, we need to find out who is not going to be there. God has a group of people saved during the great tribulation period. These are Gentiles from Gentile nations and Gentile tribes. Who are they? Well, who are not they? is what I want to look at first. The Bible says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 9 to 12, it says, The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish. Because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved, and for this reason, God will send them strong delusion and they should believe the lie and they may all be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. People are always asking me, where does America stand during the tribulation period? What does it say? Well, it not only talks about America, but it talks about parts of, of this whole world. 
This text is speaking about a group of people who are going to perish because of the miraculous activity of the lawless one, Satan himself. The Antichrist will empower, Satan, uh, Satan will empower the Antichrist and he is going to come with powers and signs and lying wonders. During this period of time, there will be a multitude of people who are going to believe this lie of Satan and the Antichrist and they are going to take the mark of the beast so that they can buy and sell and that they can be under governmental authority and, and, and they are going to be passed by when the Jews start testifying because the Bible says that God is going to send strong delusion to these people and they're going to be taken in by the lie of Satan in order that they might all be in the King James word used damned. I won't use it. I'll use the new King James word. They may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. There are, are a group of people who are going to be as lost as balls and high weeds because they have received a strong delusion from God and they are going to believe the lie of the Antichrist. And it is so that they may be condemned because they believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. This speaks of America. America is founded upon Christian principles and the light of God was on this nation. But now people are basically walking out of the light. They are walking into darkness. There's two things that we can know about our cities. Generally, they are the most religious and they are the most expensive places because all you find is churches and banks. I am now preaching at Coleman on every Sunday morning and I can hit about three churches with a rock from the parking lot of 7th Street Baptist Church. But we find out that multitudes and multitudes of people are not responding to the message of the church. We don't want to hear the message of the church, they say. We don't want to come. The church, in fact, is declining and has been doing so over the last 20, 25 years. Even the Southern Baptist Convention, as great as it is in evangelism, are baptizing less and less people every year than it did the year before. What we have at Enon is one of the most blessed things in all of the world when the Holy Spirit has determined that he will put his residence in this place. But there are so many churches that are dwindling and dying and so many preachers that are getting out of the ministry. The great concern with, with the Southern Baptist Convention is that we're all getting gray-headed. There are not many young people like Micah Miller and others who are standing, stepping up to the plate and going to preach the gospel. But the gospel is already known. In fact, America is gospel hardened with the gospel. You can find that when uh, a certain football player put John 3.16 under his eyes, 95 million hits on, on uh, the, the, the Google website wanting to know what does John 3.16 say. In spite of all of the churches that we have, we have people that, that are ignorant and saying, I don't want anything to do with the church. I know about Jesus. I know about his salvation. But right now, I'd rather not pray. I'd rather play. So God says during the great, great tribulation, those people that are gospel hardened like America is, where it is saturated with the gospel, you can read it on a rock if you want to. You, you, you can find it on road signs, everything about, about spiritual things. You can find it inside the churches. But there are folks that says, no, thank you. And during the period of the great tribulation, you would think that these people that know how to get saved would go ahead and get saved. In fact, years ago, there was a girl in our church uh, in Ewan, Alabama. Her name was Sally, and she won't mind me calling her name. Uh, 
she was uh, raised with, with, with her godly dad and, and a godly mom. Dad could play the piano like Jerry Lee Lewis played the piano. Uh, he sang, he went with me on, uh, to the prisons on, on preaching trips and to visit in the homes and do all that. Had six girls. Every morning he would open the Bible before they were able to eat. And, and, and he would read a Bible verse, have a short devotional, have a prayer. And, and, and the girls always went to church. They were in a singing group, but they had the youngest one who just didn't want to fit into that mold. Uh, she, was, she was different. Uh, she decided that she would just rebel against dad and mom and the other sisters and quit singing with them and went the way of the world. I was her pastor for a, for, for a while during this period of time. And, and I began to share with her the, the dangers of living the life the way that she was living. She said, Brother John, listen, I, I know as much about the Bible as you do. And she probably knew more because it was a constant thing at her house. It was a constant thing with the singing group. It, it was just a constant thing with her. And, she, and I told her, I said, but yeah, you're going to be left behind when the rapture takes place because you don't know Jesus as your personal savior. She said, but I know enough during the, the tribulation that when I see all of these things that the Bible says, I'll know it's time to trust Jesus as my savior. And I said, that, that's pretty neat, but it's just not theologically sound. Let me read you a verse. And so I turned to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and read the three verses I just read for you. That these people who had pleasure in unrighteousness and did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. God will send a strong delusion over them and they would be, the will believe the lie of the devil in order that they might be condemned to a living hell and to a literal hell of when the judgment of God takes place. And her eyes got real big. She said, that's talking about me, isn't it? I said, it sure is. I said, those people who have rejected the gospel of Jesus Christ before the rapture of the church, after the rapture of the church, those, those uh, religious people are going to be blinded. And the Bible says they will believe not a lie, but they will believe the lie of Satan. And God is going to cause this strong delusion to come over them because now it's judgment time and, and once judgment starts, God, God isn't going to, to stay his hand any longer. So the danger of the procrastinator, of the person that says, hey, I'm, I'm going to get saved. I really, I really, really am going to get saved. I, just not today, maybe not tomorrow. Uh, Vance Havner, the old preacher, said those that want to get saved at 12 o'clock generally die at 1130. And so we're going to see that that's what's going to happen to these people that during the tribulation, those that knew so much and, and, and knew about the church and know about the Bible and all of these things, they're going to run out of time. And when they run out of time, there, there is nothing left because God has shut the door to their salvation and, and they have sinned away their day of grace that they had to get saved. Now, you can remember in the Old Testament, there was a, a time when God shut the door to the ark. 120 years it took Noah to build that ark. And during the time that he hammered and sawed and gave a visual description of what's going on, the Bible says that Noah was a preacher of righteousness and he preached to these people. For 120 years, he said, you need to get saved you need to trust the Lord as your savior. I'm building an ark because there is a flood that is going to come and it is going to consume the whole world. And those people said no. They just went about marrying and giving in marriage, eating and drinking and being merry until Noah was placed in the ark and God shut the door. And eight people were saved, and that was all that was saved during this period of time. The rest of them experienced the great judgment of God. God had shut the door. The day of grace had expired. And it will happen that way with the rapture of the church. People are going to be gone instantaneously, 
And there are going to be those people that say, hey, I've got this figured out. I need to trust Christ as my Savior. But strong delusion comes over them. They'll believe the lie of the devil and they'll all be condemned and they will experience a literal living hell while they're during the tribulation. And then there will be a, a literal hell. So we notice that the negatives are, are, are not enough. Here is the positive. And the positive is that you'll have to come next week so that you can find out what happened. <laughs> We just ran out of time again. Are there any questions? And I'm sure there are. Yes, Rick. Uh, I, I missed it Kately, so the question may have already been asked. And if it is, I apologize for asking again. Timing and sequence. Do you think that the sequence that we're seeing is, that's the sequence. That's it. And then timing. Do you feel like that it is conceivable between some of these events, say like Horseman 1 and Horseman 2 or 3 and 4, that there could be generations of people living on Earth in these times? So when a third of the Earth's population is destroyed, in our minds, in my mind, I can't talk about it. You know, it's just like this. Boom, gone. Well, maybe I just, I let something go, and I'm thinking terms like that Nile River, and that, you know, I let it go, and it starts having an effect, and the net effect of it is a third of the world's population, whatever, but it doesn't happen just, you know, snap your fingers. I just wanted to get your thoughts. On that. Okay, I got, I got thoughts. I always got thoughts. Sometimes there's not any good. <clears throat> what we're seeing is a revelation of what happens during the expanse of the tribulation period, those seven years. We saw that with the horsemen that, that are coming and the establishment of, of Antichrist. This picture are, is going to show us those people that are martyred during those seven years. So we're at the end of the tribulation when this camera is turned on. And we're seeing this great multitude that are saved. And where did they came from, come from? I, they came out of the great tribulation and, and, and they have washed their robes in, in the blood of the lamb, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we're not seeing a particular point during the revelation. We're seeing a whole graphic point uh, as we go from beginning to the end, like we saw with the horsemen. It showed us, okay, I'm going to show you a picture of the great tribulation. This is what's going on here on earth. It's going to be characterized by four horsemen. We're, we're, we're going to have peace. We're going to have death. We're going to have diseases. And, 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 and we're, we're going to have all of these things that come because of the four horsemen. And it's going to be all across the tribulation period. All right, we're going to cross it again with, with what's in chapter 7. When we focus there around the altar... Who are those people around the altar? They, they are the multitude that were saved out of the great tribulation. So from after the church is raptured to the time that Jesus comes back, there are going to be multitudes of people that are going to be saved of Gentile origin. It is going to be God has sealed these 144,000. They will be throughout the tribulation period as well. This will not be the first time that you'll go from beginning of tribulation to the end of tribulation because we've got some more and uh, one more seal that we got to open and that will reveal seven trumpets that are going to sound and they are going to be doing all of these things during the tribulation and then you're going to see that God's going to pour out his bowls uh, 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 vials of judgment on these people and we're going to see all of these people during this period of time. Lots of people are going to die during the tribulation. We have four, eight billion, excuse me, eight billion population. One third of them we saw that they that died through that. You're going to find out that others are going to die as well. Some are going to be martyred and some are going to experience the judgment of God where the mountains are going to move and all of this stuff is taking place. All of this over a span of just seven years. First three and a half years are basically kind of peaceful setting everything. Last three and a half years is the, called the Great Tribulation. 
and and we'll get to see that a couple of times as as we look at the book this is a reason that it causes confusion to people because we normally take things chronologically we, we like to have a time sequence this happens here and after that and, and then after that then after that then after that that isn't the book of the Revelation. The book of the Revelation is thematic. It's going to talk about themes that are going to happen, and it happens through the Great Tribulation. And then God says, well, let me show you again what has taken place, and we're going to call it trumpet judgments this, this time. And then God says, let me show you again, and it's going to be called the vile judgments that are going to become, that are going to be poured out on, on, on all of these people that, that are there. So you're going to get to see the tribulation over and over and over and over again. It's a rerun looking at it from different perspectives. Clear as noonday mud, right? <laughs> I hope it is. Any other questions? Yes. They, their, their day of grace is over. Uh, they will not have a, an opportunity to be saved. Uh, that, that includes these people that heard the gospel. They've rejected the gospel. Uh, we find out that, that we as a church do everything that we can. And yet we still have people groups that have not received the gospel of Jesus Christ. Some of them have never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. In fact, in, in, in the United States of America, where I was teaching vacation Bible school uh, to a, a group of young people and uh, little sixth graders, I asked them about Jesus, and there were people that raised their hands and said, I don't know who Jesus is. I've never heard of Jesus. This is in the United States of America in Walker County. Now imagine what it's like around the world. We have people today that live within rock throwing distance of a church that don't know who Jesus is. These people will have an opportunity to be saved. They've never rejected him. They've never hardened their heart against him. They don't have pleasure in righteousness. They're just ignorant folk. During this time, there is opportunity. Oh yeah, I got it now. And, and, and then there will be this group of people that grew up in church and around church that knows church. And God said, no, you had your opportunity and that is past. So once judgment of God starts upon people and nations, he doesn't weigh his hand of judgment until after he has passed sentence and, and, and all of this has been performed. So we see that, that there will be those people who are ignorant people that will respond to the gospel. Multitudes of people will be saved. But multitudes of people will be killed and martyred because of, uh, of their convictions. And we'll see more of this later on. And now they're all standing before the throne. These that came out of the great tribulation. And that's what we're looking at here with these people. Got you? All right. Any others? Boy, you're mighty quiet. Let me dismiss this in prayer. Hey, I love you and I appreciate you. Father, thank you so much for our day today. Thank you for those people that work with electronics and computers and stuff that make some of this possible for us. We just pray that you will continue to bless us. Lord, thank you for these people that are here today. Lord, that they didn't come to hear me. They came to hear from you and what you have planned uh, for planted earth and Lord how you're going to work things out that it will glorify you and father you're going to prepare this earth as a place that that we can say is heaven and Lord we'll thank you for that and praise you for it in Jesus name amen